I look forward to sharing with you a simple process and some very practical tools to help you tap into the very best of your teams. Um, if you have any questions as you go along, I believe in your GoToWebinar um, screen that appears, you can type in some questions and I'd be happy to answer them as we go along. Okay, so we have a full hour together and um, let's get started. So I thought I would share, first of all, um, before we get into the content for today, a little bit about who I am so you know my background and the expertise that I'm sharing with you today and a little bit about who um, Connect my company is. So my name is Nicole Bendeley and thank you so much again for sharing an hour of your time with me today. I am the president of Connect and I have been focused on helping teams and leaders to tap into the very best of themselves for 15 years now. And I've actually been um, researching team and leadership performance for almost about 20 years now from the perspective of really understanding the behaviors and practices that differentiate high performance teams and high performance leaders from the rest. And what I'll be sharing with you today are those behaviors and practices that we have found through our work and research with teams um, in a number of industries, including healthcare um, and private. The, the behaviors that really differentiate teams who can excel at a high level from those who struggle to keep up. So we'll be reviewing some of those today. Now, my company, Connect, we have been helping organizations to tap into the best of their teams and leaders for over 25 years now. And we do that through the design and implementation of customized assessments to measure team and leadership performance. We develop leadership tools and processes and team performance processes and tools as well. And our work and tools are being used in organizations um, across North America and around the world um, in both healthcare organizations and non. And I know we have um, a number of people joining us from a variety of industries. And so please know that the tools and information that I'll be sharing with you today have been tested with teams of all levels of performance in a variety of industries. So I look forward to sharing them with you today. A little bit more about who we are. Our work um, has been published in almost a dozen books. Most of these, three quarters of these books, almost all of them, have been um, published by the founder, Leslie Bendeley, of our business who is also my, my, my mother. We are a mother-daughter team. And um, our most recent book that I co-authored with Leslie is Improving Healthcare Team Performance. And I know we have a few people on the, on the line today who are in healthcare. And this book is designed specifically for healthcare teams. It provides leaders with the strategies and tools they need to ensure the behaviors and practices that we have found to be most important in a healthcare environment to be sure that they are thriving and that their teams are focused on those behaviors and practices. So that's a little bit about who we are and the background that we bring to um, this webinar. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what you're going to walk away with today. You know, I'm sure you're on this call partly because you yourself have experienced how challenging it really can be to affect real and lasting change in team performance, right? Team development is not an easy process, but if you have a simple process that is clear and practical along with the right tools and techniques, you will find team performance to go a lot more smoothly and that you will be able to affect not only affect lasting change, but you will be able to really create accountability from your team members for the performance of the team. Because at the end of the day, the performance of your team is not just your responsibility as the leader or just the responsibility of you as the, as the HR professional. It has to be a shared responsibility with the bulk of that responsibility resting on your team members. And that can be quite challenging to, to create that sense of accountability. So part of the goal for today is to not only provide you with a simpler process that has worked and does work and has worked for the past 25 years in our business, 
but to provide you with tools and techniques to ensure that dialogue is happening within your team regularly and that how we work together and, and the team's performance becomes a priority and everybody's responsibility. Okay, so that's really what you'll walk away with today. And I also want to be sure you have tools in your toolkit to um, affect some positive behavior change. So you'll be getting some tools specifically to obviously implement this five-step process, but also tools to um, strengthen two key areas of an exceptional team, which is a team's cohesiveness and a team's climate, the health of their climate. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the call. Now, what you'll need for the next hour, we will be sharing, or I will be sharing, a ton of information um, with you. You know, this session is usually a one-day, if not a two-day session, depending on the need um, of the leaders. And we are pulling everything together, or as much as we can together, to, to make this hour um, as impactful for you as we can. And so we're sharing quite a bit of information with you. And so what you'll need is a pen and paper. Um, I will be sharing the tools with you on a website after the call so that you will have access to most of the information that I'm sharing on this um, session at the website. But do please have a pen and paper ready so that you can keep some notes. You'll also notice my email address is included below. That's there for a reason. That's there so that we can continue the dialogue after this session. So if at any point in time you have any questions about the learning you gained today or the tools that you're going to get, please send me a note. I'm happy to talk to you about how to best use them or to answer any of your questions relating to team and leadership performance. You'll also need focus. You know, we have very busy days and we are inundated by cell phones, text messages, um, emails, and, and I really want this hour to be somewhat of a gift to you, okay? An hour where you can really dedicate your attention to your own growth and the growth of your team. And in order for this to be a real gift and, and to um, add to your own personal development, it's important to turn off any distractions that, that may get in your way of really focusing on, on what we're going to be learning today. Okay? All right. So let's get started. I want to start by sharing with you the five steps that we're going to be going through in detail today. Okay, now these are the five steps that we use um, in our team development process with the teams that we lead. It's the process that we've been using for 25 years and it's a process that we built our um, online tool um, our team fitness tool, which is a software tool, we base that tool on this process because it works and it has worked time and time again. So the five steps that we're going to be reviewing today are being committed, so committing to the process, getting clear on exactly what it is that you want to achieve, on what exceptional team performance looks like, getting clear on your team's strengths and our, your team's opportunities for improvement. Okay, that's the second step. The third step we're going to be looking at today is engaging your team in the process and creating that accountability for the team's performance so that when you get to the fourth step of actually taking action to improve upon the team's growth opportunities and to ensure that your team members are demonstrating the behaviors and practices most essential to their effectiveness, that everybody is participating and sharing the load. And then the fifth step is checking in, maintaining the momentum, and repeating the process. So we're going to go through each of these steps together. So the first step is commit to it. And this is the most important step of all of them. Because if you are not 100% committed to developing your team and to doing the work that is required to affect real and lasting improvement, then don't do it. So I have a question for you. Think about your team. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how committed are you to improving the effectiveness of your team. 
Now what I'd like is for you to jot down the number that comes to mind as far as how committed you are to improving the effectiveness of your team. Write that number down on a piece of paper in front of you. So if you didn't write down a 10, I'm going to urge you to give some more thought to really how committed you are to developing your team. Because in order for team development to be a success, there absolutely must be a commitment from you, the team leader, to make it a success. Without your commitment, without dedicated time, resources, brain power, focused attention, it's not going to work. Right? You're either in it or you're not. You're either committed to it or you're not. And one of the biggest things that occurs in a team development process, one of the biggest barriers to team performance, and one of the biggest reasons why team development fails is because there is a lack of commitment from leaders and the individuals who are really responsible for implementing the process. And when there is a lack of commitment, what happens is that um, it can even it can have a, even more of a detrimental impact on the team because we find that team members at the beginning, the leader and the team are really excited about the process, they buy into the process, and then a month in things start to fall off. Or not even a month in, a couple of weeks in, things start to fall off and people lose focus on the priority of developing the team. And that's when we hear, oh, this will never work. This is just another team building process. These things never work. And they don't work because oftentimes there isn't that true dedicated commitment. And by commitment, I mean dedicating time and resources, role modeling the behaviors and practices that you expect from your team members, providing feedback regularly, right? So constructive and positive feedback. Holding team members accountable by creating conversations around team performance and ensuring that happens every day. So, so these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at through this process, giving you tools to do these things, okay? And so I don't want to move on from this, this first step Quickly. I really want to ensure that, that you all engage in a team development process only if you are 100% committed to it. So if you didn't respond to the question, how committed are you, if you didn't respond with a 10, I'd like you to ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, what's in it for me? Okay, ask yourself why you would even begin a team development process. Okay, What are you as a leader going to gain from it? What's in it for your team? What's in it for your, your clients, your customers, your patients? And what's in it for your bottom line? So get very clear on why you're doing this. Once you get clear on your purpose and the benefits that you will reap from a team development process, and dedicating actual time and resources and brain power and energy and focus to it, you're going to see these results. And, and the results and studies have shown for years that the results that, that you and your teams and your clients and your organization will reap as a result of improved team performance. And these are just a few, okay? greater trust, respect, and communication. You'll build a healthier climate. And with healthier climates, your team members will be far more productive, far more engaged, and will have the ability to perform at a higher level. Okay? High-performance teams take ownership for the success of their teams, and they're focused on continuous improvement. All right? They take the initiative to get things done. They're far more innovative and collaborative. They, get, they do more work more easily. Okay, they achieve better results with less struggle. And as far as the bottom line, you'll have better client satisfaction, lower turnover, better efficiencies, and your bottom line will be impacted at the end of the day. 
I heard a quote the other day at the um, HRPA conference here um, in Toronto. And the quote was, if you want to improve your bottom line, improve your front line. And that goes directly to team development as well. Okay, so that's the first step. Commit to it. The next step is getting clear. Once you're committed, it's important to get clear on exactly what it is that you want to achieve exactly the areas of your team's performance that need to improve. And in order to do that, you need to first understand what exceptional teamwork looks like. So it's interesting because in order for a team to become better than it is, right, like I said before, the goals to be, um, to be achieved must be clearly understood. Now when we work with teams and leaders, they, they usually have some ideas as to what could be better in the team, right? We often hear, well, I think we really need to communicate better, or I think that there's a lack of respect or trust, or if we, you know, had, um, we were able to manage change better, then we'd be okay. But few people, however, have very specific knowledge and understanding of what is required for high-performance teamwork. So therefore, even when a team is consciously trying to improve or embarking on a team development process, critical aspects that may be blocking the team's performance can be overlooked, right? If there isn't a clear understanding of the behaviors and practices that are most essential to team performance, then no matter how much work you do, there are going to be areas that are still consistently blocked and preventing the team from excelling. And unless there's an understanding of those behaviors and practices that make the biggest difference, teams often focus on areas that really aren't that important to their ability to work together or don't directly drive them to better goals or better um, efficiencies or better teamwork. So getting clear means, first of all, understanding what these behaviors and practices are. What are the behaviors that differentiate high-performance teams from all of the rest. The next part of getting clear means knowing your team's specific strengths and knowing their opportunities for improvement relative to the behaviors and practices that are essential to team performance. And then once you know those three things, then you can set specific teamwork goals. One of the challenges of team development processes is that if they are not specific and needs-based and behavior-based and focused on the behaviors and practices that, that need to be present within the team that are missing, then it's not as impactful. The most, the most effective team development processes leverages a team's specific strengths and then focuses their attention on the behaviors and practices that are missing or need to be developed. Okay? So in order to strengthen your team's effectiveness, you must first have a clear understanding of what a high-performance team looks like, and your team must have the same understanding. Okay, you and your team members must know at all times the behaviors and practices essential to working effectively together. So this is where we're going to start looking at the seven elements of a high performance team. And I'm going to share with you the behaviors and practices that make the biggest difference. But want to give you a little bit of background as how we came to identify these behaviors and practices. So we've been asking for many years now, for over 20 years, what's the difference between teams that achieve exceptional results with ease and those that struggle to keep up? And through our work and research with teams of all, all types across a number of industries, we've identified, and we identified these about 15 years ago, um, seven elements of a high performance team. We're going to review each of these at a high level. And that we're reviewing these because you're going to use these to strengthen your team. You're going to walk away with a tool that will allow you to have a dialogue with your team around these elements so that you and your team members can identify what they're already doing really well and what areas need improvement. So that's the reason why I'm sharing this with you now, okay? And we're going to walk through how you can do that. 
So a little bit of background. So these seven elements make up our team assessment called the team fitness test. Okay, it includes 35 behaviors and practices that have been found to differentiate high performance teams from the rest. Those of you on the call who are in, in healthcare, we also have a version of this that are specific to healthcare teams because through our research we found that healthcare teams need to demonstrate different behaviors and practices. Not all of them are different, some of them are different given the environment that you work in in healthcare. But for, the call, for today's call, we're focusing on the seven elements of a high-performance team for non-healthcare environments, okay? So this um, set of seven elements, each element is measured by five behaviors and practices, okay, so for a total of 35. On today's session, I'm giving you three behaviors and practices for each of them. So you're going to be walking away with 21 of them okay, that you can use with your teams to gauge their strengths and their opportunities for improvement and then identify what the team will do going forward to improve. Okay? So we're going to go through um, each of the elements and I'd like you to think of the team that you lead or the team that you work in. Um, I think we have a number of consultants on the call as well for teams that you support. And, and so think of one particular team. And as we review the elements and the behaviors that measure each element, I'd like you to ask yourself, does my team demonstrate these behaviors and practices? Yes, no, or sometimes. Okay, this is a, a simpler way to, uh, a less scientific way to measure your team's performance, but it's effective. Okay, and, and the team assessment itself uses a five-point Likert scale, but this is a tool that I'm giving you through this session so that you can create a dialogue by asking the questions of your team to say, how well are we doing within this element, so that you can create a dialogue. So the first element we're going to review is a healthy climate. This is um, the most important element of the seven. Because if your team members are not operating in a climate that is positive, where people feel comfortable being honest and open with one another, where people feel valued and respected, then it doesn't matter if you try and improve your change compatibility or your shared leadership. That's not going to improve if the health of the climate isn't strong. Okay, That's where we need to start if there are issues within the team around trust and respect and a lack of communication, it's often due to the health of the climate. And so let's take a look at some of the behaviors and practices that show up or that measure this. So again, think of the team that you're working in or leading and ask yourself, does my team demonstrate this? Yes, no, or sometimes. Do team members consistently treat one another with equal respect? Do team members foster an environment of openness and trust? And do team members manage conflict effectively? Okay. So these are three of the behaviors that measure healthy climate. Healthy climate is also measured by um, how good we feel about, the about being a member of the team. It's also measured by whether or not we feel as though our contributions are valued and respected. Okay, so it's our, it's our ability to feel good about the team. You know, I, I had an interesting conversation with um, the CEO of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, Hugh McLeod, a number of years ago when I was writing our book. And we talked about the impact of the healthy climate. And, and he had an interesting observation. He said he can um, detect the health of a team, um, a healthcare team, within nanoseconds of stepping onto the hospital floor. And he said he will have one of two immediate gut reactions. One reaction would be, it feels good here. And then he can walk down the hallway to another hospital ward where, except for the color of paint on the walls, it looks exactly the same, same type of staffing pattern, same similar type of patients, same logistics um, systems and IT systems and all of that. 
except when he walks onto the floor, he has the opposite reaction of, it doesn't feel good here. And he, Mr. McLeod and I know that this isn't anchored in any scientific rigor, but the, the difference is palpable. Okay, in one experience, the it feels good here, there are positive teamwork patterns, positive relationships, and you can feel the energy. It's a warm climate. Okay, when you walk onto a team that is, um, is almost in crisis or it's operating in an unhealthy cold climate, you can also feel it. Your team members feel it, and they walk away feeling depleted. Okay, so the main difference between a healthy climate and a cold climate is in a cold climate, your team members are going home feeling depleted, not because of the stress of the job itself or the workload, but they're going home feeling depleted because they're depleting one another's energy. Instead of giving each other energy, they're taking energy from one another due to gossip, backstabbing, silos, breakdowns in communication, negative energy, negative attitudes, a lack of trust, all of those things that impact climate. In a healthy climate, team members may be stressed, they may have heavy workloads, and they may go home feeling tired and stressed, but it's not because they're depleting one another's energy. In fact, they work to lift one another up and build each other's energy, especially in times of stress. That's what a healthy climate looks like, because there is a basis of trust and respect and value for one another. So if you answered no or sometimes for these questions here, then the, your team's climate needs some work. Um, and I will be sharing at the end of this call, you will be getting a dedicated website with tools to use. There will be a tool that you will be getting a facilitator guide and team exercise to strengthen the health of your climate. Now, just by going through the five-step process and committing to team development, you will begin to strengthen the health of the climate. Okay? But I caution you, if you're working with a team that has an unhealthy climate, do not start this process, like I said, unless you're committed to following through with it and sticking with it. Um, because if you start it and then stop, it can be even more detrimental to the health of your team's climate. Okay. So the next element is cohesiveness. All right. So cohesiveness measures the degree to which your team members are pulling together in the same direction. Are your team members pulling together in the same direction towards a common goal, or are they pulling in different directions and all focusing on different priorities, demonstrating different values that are wasting energy and time and pulling people away from the work and the values necessary to achieve the organization's and team's goals? Okay. So, here are some questions for you to ask yourself about your team. Are our mandate goals and objectives clear and agreed to by, by my team members? Do we have strong agreed upon beliefs about how to achieve success? And if we were each asked to list team priorities, our list would be similar. Teams that are not cohesive, like I said, will waste time and energy on tasks and activities that aren't leading them directly to their goal. There's a lot of inefficiencies happening within teams that are, are, are not cohesive. And I want to share with you an example of a very successful organization that is highly cohesive. So many of you are probably familiar with Southwest Airlines. Okay, Southwest Airlines has been the subject of a number of studies on leadership success, organizational success, organizational culture success, um, primarily because this is an, um, a company that has remained profitable and successful in a struggling industry. It has managed to keep its costs low and in an industry that had seen, you know, high, high costs over the past several years, past number of years. Um, and so the success of this organization has been contributed or attributed uh, mostly to its founder, Herb Keller. 
and he was the previous CEO. And I want to share a story with you that highlights how focused um, Keller and his teams were on achieving a common goal. And there's a story about Keller teaching his protege how to lead the company. And the story goes, he turns to his protege, Mark, and he says, Mark, I can teach you how to lead this company as well as I can in 30 seconds. Here it is. Southwest Airlines provides the most outstanding service. We don't just provide outstanding service. We provide the most outstanding service. And we provide the most outstanding service at the lowest fares. We don't just provide low fares. We provide the lowest fares. And once you understand what our goal is and what it is that we do, you can make any decision about this organization as well as I can. And once your team members understand this goal and what success looks like for Southwest, they can make any decision about this organization as well as I can. And he goes on to give an example. He says, suppose Sarah from marketing comes into your office and says, you know, I think the passengers from the Houston to Vegas flight would like a nice light Caesar salad. What do you say to Sarah? And he answers himself. You say, Sarah, you first ask Sarah a question. And you ask Sarah, how will adding a nice light chicken Caesar salad to the Houston to Vegas flight make us the airline that provides the most outstanding service at the lowest fares. And you engage Sarah in a conversation. You also need to recognize Sarah's contribution and recognize the fact that Sarah came to you with an idea. Because maybe it's a good idea and maybe it's not. It actually doesn't really matter. The most important thing is acknowledging and recognizing Sarah and then engaging in her in a dialogue around what our vision is and empowering her to determine whether or not that idea will work given what we're working towards. So Kelleher built this phenomenally successful organization by basically being a broken record and enabling conversations from the um, ground crew to the C-suite around how can we ensure we are consistently delivering the most outstanding service at the lowest fares. And he engaged as many people as he could into those conversations so that everybody from the ground crew to the C-suite knew at all times what it is that they were work that what it is that they're working towards and that they know that they have the power now to make decisions because they know what the best decision looks like. The best decision will ensure that we provide the most outstanding service at the lowest fares. If it doesn't lead us towards that goal, then let's not have that, let's not make that decision. And as a result, Southwest has a highly engaged staff who are cohesively pulling together in the same direction to achieve success. Success for Southwest and su success for their customers. And so when it comes to building a cohesive team, so if you identified cohesiveness as, as being weak, or even if you didn't, this is an interesting tip um, or exercise to do with your team, and I urge you to try it. So at your next team meeting, ask your team members to write down what they feel is the team's main goal. What are we trying to achieve? What is, what is it that we're working towards? What's our purpose? Why do we come to work every day? Right? What's our goal? And then have everybody share the goal. And see how, whether their responses are similar or are they different. And then ask team members to list your three key priorities to achieving that goal. And it, that's a very interesting question as well because chances are people will come up with a whole bunch of different priorities. You want to ensure that your team is aligned towards the main goal of the team and that the priorities are aligned as well and that your team members are dedicating their valuable energy and time and resources on the priorities most important to achieving that goal. Because if they're not focused on the same priorities, and your priorities might change by the way, 
and they likely will, but revisiting them monthly um, if your priorities tend to change regularly. Revisit them because if your team members aren't focused on the same priorities, they're going to be pulling in different directions. Okay, so that's the second element, cohesiveness. The third element is group work skills. So this really speaks to a team's ability to work well in a meeting. Okay, so this element ha is a part of the team assessment because team members spend so much of their time in meetings. Okay, and if our time spent in meetings isn't well spent, we're wasting time and we're creating frustration and we are um, oftentimes reaching decisions that aren't the best decisions for the organization if our meetings aren't working well, or we're reaching decisions that don't have the right support and buy-in for them, okay, which is imp impacting the implementation of those decisions. And so ideally, we want our, t our meetings to be as efficient as possible so that we can make the best decisions with buy-in and support for those de decisions and spend less time in meetings as a result. Okay, so do you leave your meetings with a sense of accomplishment? Yes, no, or sometimes. Do team members make team meetings a priority? And do you have, uh, does your team have effective consensus reaching skills? Do you find that you're able to reach consensus um, fairly easily? Or have the skills to facilitate a consensus reaching process. Okay. Now, for those of you who lead meetings, you may be interested to know that we are offering um, a complimentary meeting facilitation skills webinar. I believe it's next week. You can check the Team Fitness Tool website if you feel that group work skills is lacking. Jump on another webinar and happy to share some skills with some tools with you. So the next element is team members' contribution. And this really speaks to your team members' ability to be proactive. Are they proactively contributing to the success of the team or to the team's effectiveness? Are they looking for new and better ways to improve service delivery or to achieve the team's goals or to improve team performance? Are they, are they coming to you, their leader, with new ideas, right? Or are they waiting for you, are they waiting to be asked? Do team members look to, to improve upon things on their own, or are they, being, are they waiting to be asked? Okay? So do team members take the initiative to share ideas and concerns? Yes, no, or sometimes. Do team members take the initiative to do what needs to be done without waiting to be asked? Do team members look for opportunities to improve team performance? Okay, that's a very telling um, behavior. So when you're looking to create greater accountability within your team, or you're looking to um, assess, even assess accountability for team performance, ask that question. Are my team members actively looking for ways to improve how we work? Are they coming to me with new ideas? Are they, do they seem committed and engaged in, in how we're functioning and improving our ability to function? And the goal, even through this team development process, right, part of the outcome of it is increased team members' contribution, right, strengthening that just by going through the process. The next element is change compatibility. And this is an element that was added to this assessment, um, gosh, I would guess about 10 years ago. Originally, it was a five-element assessment. Um, and this was added about 10 years ago when the pace of change just began to really increase. Not just the pace of change, in the vo but the volume of change. And it, it hasn't slowed down. I'm sure all of you can, can attest to that, and your team members can certainly attest to that. And, and if, we, if we're a team that doesn't have the ability to effectively manage change, and by manage change, I mean be open to it and approach it with a positive attitude, even if we don't agree with it, rather than resisting it at all costs, 
Okay, in order to be an exceptional team, we need the ability to come together to talk about the change that's occurring and find ways to make it work for us and our customers or our patients, even if we don't agree with it. So we want teams that are change compatible versus teams that resist change or the flip side of that is we see um, change survivors, right? Teams that, that wait and see and just hope that the change will go away and if we, don't, if we ignore it and don't do our best to implement it, it will go away. And that's when we see things not sticking, right? Change initiatives happen and then they don't work and then something else has to, has to come aboard and, and, and we'll, we'll try this, but it doesn't work. Okay, so we want teams that are change compatible. So here are some questions for you. Do team members demonstrate a positive attitude towards change? And by demonstrating a positive attitude towards change, I mean even towards change with which they don't agree. Do team members look for ways to make change work? And do team members effectively support one another through change? Okay. Now these are just three of the behaviors. Um, some other behaviors are do, do team members, um, do we have uh, skills and abilities to implement change effectively? Um, do, we, uh, do we feel overwhelmed by change or is, is change um, happening too quickly for us or too, too much for us? Okay. Now, um, in the coming months, we'll also have another webinar for change compatibility. I believe there's one coming up in March, so just keep a close eye. We try to offer webinars that target the different areas of an exceptional team um, monthly. So if this is an area that you want to focus on and want some additional tips, just keep an eye out um, in your email um, as we'll be, we'll be promoting one for this coming up. This next element is interesting, and it's, it's when teams are strong in the shared leadership element, we see a strong sense of accountability for the team um, success and a strong partnership, shared leadership between the leader and the team. So this is really a two, two parts to, this, to this, this element. It's the team members' behaviors, but it's also the leader's behaviors. So shared leadership is the strongest when a leader is able to step outside of the center of the team and enable the team to, to make decisions on their own. So teams that are strong in shared leadership are led by individuals who um, um, engage team members in dialogue regularly, who ask team members for their opinion and use team members' opinions and expertise. Um, are individuals who are comfortable having coaching conversations, right? In, in teams that have low shared leadership and low accountability and low engagement, it's, uh, they're, they're often led by individuals who don't yet have the skills to, um, to really have those coach-like conversations and, and, or who are more comfortable just taking issues from the team and running with them on their own and, and, and solving issues for team members with the best of intent, right? I work with so many leaders and I myself am guilty of it at times, right? Is it's easier, I'm just going to solve this for you, I know the answer, I'm going to go do it. Um, but that impacts a team's um, empowerment and ability to solve issues on their own. So shared leadership. Do team members seek and use input from team members on a regular basis? Okay, so it's not just paying lip service, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, just to make people feel like they're being asked, but using it, using their input. Do team leaders empower team members to solve problems on their own? And are the right people involved in the right decisions? And so our, we have exercises to help strengthen shared leadership that really bring teams together to talk about their level of influence within the team and to look at how decisions are being made within the team and to get down to specific examples around this type of decision is right now being made just by the manager, but
but can it be made? Is this an opportunity for team members to play a part? So it creates a dialogue around the types of decisions that are being made and who should be a part of those decisions. So a tip to strengthen shared leadership. So if you answered no or sometimes, one tip is to ask more questions. Right? Instead of first prescribing a solution, ask a question. What do you think we should do? Right? So if you walk away from this webinar and you're not quite ready to embark on a team development process, and that's okay, because like I said, it's best not to start if you don't have the time and resources and brain power and focus to do it right now. So if you don't have the time and, or ability to do it right now, if you at least walk away with one thing, it's ask more questions and engage your team members in dialogue every day around what it is that we're working towards and what can we do to be an even better team and achieve our goals more easily. Have more conversations and ask more questions. And that in and of itself will have a big impact on your team's climate, on their engagement, and on their, their level of accountability. The next element is innovative thinking. Okay, so this really speaks to a team's ability to challenge the status quo, challenge one another's thinking, and take some risks. Okay, and by innovative thinking, I don't mean, you know, the team needs to come up with the latest iPhone, you know, or phone to rival uh, Apple. Um, it's about everyday innovative thinking, right? It's the little things that we can do differently to achieve better results or to have a more positive experience. Right? Or are we, are, we, are we just going along with, the, with groupthink, or are we really looking for new and better ways of doing things? Okay? Are we comfortable rocking the boat a little bit for the purpose of improved performance and for the betterment of the team and the organization? So I'm not sharing with you tools to strengthen all of these elements today, but the goal in sharing them with you is to bring your team together for a dialogue so that they can identify what they're doing really well now against each of these seven elements and where they need to improve. Okay, so on the website I'm going to be giving you, you'll have access to the slides for each of these seven elements so that you can share them with your team in a team meeting and really go through them together. And we'll walk through that process in a minute. So as a recap, the seven elements of a high-performance team. Okay, we've reviewed each of them. You have some behaviors and practices to measure your teams against and to ask your team members to measure themselves as a team against so that you can create a dialogue. So as far as the second step, this was a big second step for you. Um, your takeaways as leaders is to spend some time understanding those behaviors and practices. Right? And, and reflect on where you feel your team is strong and where you feel your team needs to work okay, to improve. And, and then set some teamwork goals. From your perspective, giving your team's growth opportunities, what do you think they need to strengthen first? So I'm not asking you to identify all of the things that they need to improve right away, but the most important piece. Okay, so if climate is weak, certainly that's priority one. Maybe you've identified three elements that they could improve upon. Well, pick one that you think is most important. Okay, so that's the second step. Get clear. Step three is engage your team. Okay, so your next step then is to bring your team together for a one-hour meeting where you're engaging them in a dialogue around those seven elements so that they can identify their strengths and their growth opportunities and what they feel they need to work on and are committed to improving. So you're not coming to this meeting and saying, this is what I think you need to improve upon. You've given some thought to it, for sure, but this is your team's opportunity to have a conversation and to really participate in identifying their strengths and opportunities for improvement. Now, at the end of this session, you're going to get a facilitator guide okay, that will walk you through this team meeting. So you'll have all of the script, all of the questions you need to ask your teams, 
so that you can have a productive, positive, powerful team development session. Okay, so I'm just going to go through this at a high level because you have the guide. So this is a one hour meeting. So the structure of the meeting is you'll introduce the purpose of the meeting, you'll review the seven elements, so you'll have those slides to review with your team members. Then what you're going to do is you're going to break, if you've got a team of 10 people, for example, break into two groups of five. Okay, so break into smaller groups. You will have a handout to, that is on the website that I'll give you to give to your team members for them to work together, so a little team exercise where they will review the seven elements together, identify their strengths with examples as to how those strengths are showing up on a daily basis, and identify their team's opportunities for improvement. Then they're going to identify which element they feel the team needs to focus on first and come to agreement on that. Okay? So there's some script in your facilitator guide around how to introduce the purpose of the meeting. And it's very positive, it's very much focused on becoming an even better team and identifying things that we can do together to have an even better experience and achieve better results with less struggle. Okay? You're going to review the seven elements. They're going to break into their groups, identify their strengths and opportunities for improvement and the element to focus on. And then the facilitator guide walks you through identifying specific commitments to action. So let's say your team identifies the fact that, you know what, we really need to work on our team member's contribution, right? It walks you through a way to, for your team to identify specific commitments to action for doing that. So for example, okay, here's an example. Let's say they identify they need to strengthen their team's climate. You ask them to generate specific behaviors and practices. What do we need to do to strengthen our climate? Ask them to brainstorm, capture them on the flip chart, and, and identify the top five that are most important to strengthening the climate or strengthening cohesiveness or whatever it is that you're working towards. Okay? All of this is what you, you're walked through all of this in the facilitator guide that you're going to be getting. Okay? And then identify specific next steps including how, great, we've identified, you know, these five things that we're going to do to strengthen your clim our climate. And here's an example for you, okay, on the screen. We agree that we're going to do this, but how are we going to keep one another accountable? Ask your team members to identify ways to keep one another accountable so that this just doesn't become a one-time, great, we've identified these things, but nobody actually follows through on them. Okay? Here are some examples for group work skills. We agree to arrive on time, voice our opinions, listen to one another. Okay? The goal is, though, for your team members to identify these behaviors and practices, these commitments to action that need to show up more regularly in order to improve that element. And you're just focusing on one element, not all of them. Okay? So like I said, you'll get a facilitator guide for walking through each of these. This is a key step. You want your team members engaged, having dialogue, and identifying from their perspective what's working and what needs to improve and what needs to happen within the team to improve. So the tools you're going to be getting is your team facilitator guide, okay? The seven elements of a PowerPoint, of a PowerPoint slide, the seven elements of a high-performance team, which is a PowerPoint slide and your team activity for identifying strengths and growth opportunities. Okay, so that's step three, bringing your team together. The fourth step is taking action, right? One team meeting isn't going to produce change. And we see this time and time again, and I'm sure you've experienced it before. Your team has a great experience in a team building session, rah, 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 we've identified all these great things we're going to do, and then it falls flat, right? Nothing happens. And that's because teams lack the tools um, to continue to maintain that momentum. Teams lack um, perhaps the, the leadership to keep team performance and those commitments to action top of mind and in front of the team and holding teams feet, the team's feet to the fire and holding them accountable. Okay? Team performance will 
um, improve with consistent action, with feedback, and team dialogue. So what you need is the right tools and techniques to enable this action. So I want to give some to you. All right, so some techniques that we have found to really make a difference is creating a champion team. Okay, a champion team is a small group of people who are responsible for keeping team development alive, who ensure that the team comes back to revisit the commitments to action. Um, the champion team uses team exercises regularly um, within team meetings. Okay, team exercise is designed to strengthen the different areas of team performance. If you go to the Team Fitness Tool website, you'll find some team exercises on the site. Um, and our online team development system is designed to generate team exercises to strengthen the different areas of a team's um, performance. So if you want to learn more about that software product that would give you all of these tools to do this, um, you're welcome to take a look at it, of course. So champion teams are key to maintaining the process. Monday morning team huddles, okay? Having a quick 10-minute huddle the beginning of every week that asks the team, okay, what did we do last week to strengthen our climate, for example? What did we do really well? What do we need to do this week to be even better, to have an even healthier team climate? Okay, having regular focused conversations with the entire team that can be quick, but keep the team momentum going. Use team exercises. So you're going to be getting two, for one for climate, one for cohesiveness. Okay, use team exercises. If you don't want to get them from us, there are a number of resources online that you can search for team development exercises. Incorporate them in every team meeting. And then check in regularly. How are we doing? Okay, ask the question. What can we do even better? So you'll be getting three team exercises. An exercise for maintaining team fitness, that it's a 15-minute exercise that you can use every eight weeks at a team meeting to refocus the team on those commitments to action, bring them back to the forefront and say, give me some examples on how we're doing these, these things that we committed to. What difference is it making to our team? Is there anything else we need to be doing to improve? Okay, continuing the conversation. So you'll have an exercise to do that. You'll have an exercise to strengthen your team's climate and strengthen your team cohesiveness. And these are examples of exercises that are generated by our team fitness tool as well to give you a sense of what you get through the tool. And then finally, check in and repeat, okay? Use that team fitness exercise every eight weeks to focus your team on team development and making it a priority, okay? And every eight weeks, I recommend revisiting the seven elements. What did we approve upon in the last eight weeks? Because, for example, if you're strengthening climate, I'm sure you are going to see improvement in some of the other areas as well. And then ask the question, what should we focus on now? If we've strengthened cohesiveness, now what should we work on? So the goal is continuous and never-ending improvement by having this dialogue on a regular basis and holding people accountable to it. Okay, so you receive the five steps. And if you commit to it and follow this process, and don't just do it once, keep going. Make it part of the team's culture, part of the team's processes, you'll see visible improvement in your team's performance. So I want to take you through now to your website, theteamfitnesstool.com slash five steps. If you go to that site, your tools are there re re uh, ready and waiting for you. Okay, all of the tools that I shared with you today are on the website, teamfitnesstool.com slash five steps. So you have the PowerPoint slide of the seven elements, your facilitator guides, your team exercises, everything is here so that you can get started right away. And like I said, if you have any questions, my email is at the bottom. Feel free to reach out. And if you would like a demo of the team fitness tool, Okay, you can email me or request a demo on our website, 
and um, happy to set you up for one if you want this team process to be more automated for you. Okay, so thank you all so, so very much. I wish you all wonderful days, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. All the best.